Yeah, you, you guys missed Adam's talk earlier, all clients suck, right? Yeah, okay. All right, well, it's time. Let's get started. So we're going to be talking about mastering the client consultation. My name is Nathan Ingram. I am from Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, yeah, how about that? I'm gonna, there, I'll be slipping in a y'all every now and then. Is that okay? Is that allowed up here? Okay. Uh, I'm the host at iThemes Training. We do WordPress education, two or three live webinars a week. Virtually everything we do is free. It's like being at WordCamp all year. So the kind of talks you'll hear, you hear here is the kind of things that we do online all the time. I'm also the host of the WP Business Podcast, which is a little premature. It's going to drop in about three weeks. Uh, if you work with clients, this is a podcast designed for people doing WordPress, working with clients. How about that? It's mywpbusiness.com. If you want to sign up there, I'll send you an email when it drops. Uh, I'm also a, uh, a business coach for WordPress freelancers. I've been doing that since 2014. It's a lot of fun. I, my passion is to help WordPress business owners grow and blow up the common obstacles. That's one of the reasons I'm giving this talk today. And last of all, I myself have been a freelance business owner in the web space since 1995. That's ancient, I realize. That's when I built and sold my first website. And I've made a million mistakes since then. So I used to start a talk like this with a slide that says, I am not an expert. But now I've decided that I am an expert, according to Dr. Niels Bohr, who says that an expert is a person who has found out by his own painful experience all the mistakes a person can make in a very narrow field. By that definition, I'm an expert. So if I can help you not make the same mistakes I make, have made, then that's why we're here today. And a lot of the times, a lot of the places we make mistakes as WordPress business owners is in that first initial client consultation, the coffee meeting, right? Where you're meeting with a client the first time trying to figure out if this whole thing, uh, what this project is about. So here's what we're going to talk about over the next, you know, 40 minutes or so. The first is why you desperately need a strategy for client consultations. And I promise, you desperately need a strategy. Then we're going to look at why are we doing this to begin with? What is the purpose of the client consultation? Last of all, we're going to talk about the uh, scope strategy, which is really the meat of the presentation. By the way, I love talking about clients. This is my second most favorite talk I give on clients. I'm glad you asked that question. I actually wrote a book about it. It just dropped uh, last month on Amazon. It's called Dealing with Problem Clients, Building Fences Around Friendly Monsters. It's a lot of fun. Uh, so it's out there on Kindle and in print. And I may give a couple of those books away today, depending on what kind of time we have. OK, so we are going to pause for questions at the end of each section. OK? Also, you can tweet at me if you'd like. I am at Nathan Ingram on Twitter uh, and the hashtag WC Dayton. And by the way, so that you don't have to furiously scribble if you're typing sh sh Pay attention, download the slides later, nathaningram.com slash WCDayton. There you'll find all the slides. Everything you see on the screen is there as a PDF. Also, at that link, you can get a one-pager of the whole scope strategy. So everything is put into one page. It's right there. Go download it. It's there. Uh, there might also happen to be a link to this book <clears throat> if you know, you're interested. That's all right. So, but that's all there for free. Check it out. Uh, all right. So why is it important to have a strategy for the client consultation. Why is a scope strategy important? So I'm sitting in a coffee shop, and maybe you can relate to the story. I'm sitting in a coffee shop, and I'm meeting with a client for the first time. How many of you meet with clients over coffee? At their place, your place, Starbucks, whatever. Yeah, I do that all the time. There's a, a Starbucks about a mile from me that is like my second office. They, it's like Cheers. They, they know my name. Uh, so I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, okay, this client has real potential, right? Like, this is going to go well. You know, good, great conversation. Everything's going great. And then all of a sudden, we keep talking, and he starts telling the story about how his dog got out from the fence, and it's going on and on. And all of a sudden, it's 45 minutes later, and we're still talking about the stupid dog. I mean, I love dogs. I have two. They're both rescued. It's great. Love dogs. No problem. But 45 minutes? Give me a break. So I've spent 45 minutes with this client, and we finally get around to talking about the website. This person has no idea what they want. They have no goals. No, they, they don't know what they want. So I've just wasted an hour of my life with this person. So have you ever been in a situation where you've spent hours talking to a client and gotten nowhere? Does that sound familiar? Yeah, me too. Okay, so I'm sitting in my car one day, and I just meeting, uh, I just met with this particular client. You know, I'm thinking about, you know, this is going really well. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's been a great meeting. And then I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. I forgot to mention the fact that 
I offer WordPress management services. We talked all about their website, and I didn't talk anything about recurring services on the back end. And if I've learned anything over my years of working with clients, it's that if you're going to sell a WordPress management plan, security, backup, hosting, any of that stuff, you've got to start at the first conversation. You can't add it on later. They never buy it. It's got to start at the first conversation. So I'm sitting there in my car, and I realize I forgot to talk about this. So have you ever gotten through a meeting and realized you forgot to cover something that was important for the project? Me too. That's why you need a strategy for that first client meeting. How about this? I'm checking my email, and I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for the client to respond after I'd emailed them a proposal. And I, cause I agonized over this proposal, right? You know how it goes. You sit there, and you write everything down, and you get a good scope of work, and you put a price tag on it, and then you erase the price. Okay, it's 3500 No, no, no. $4,500. No, no, no. 4120 No, no, no. 37.75. That's yeah, right. Do you ever do that? Anybody else do that? Yeah. Okay. So, I'm I'm sitting there and I finally get the email and the client says, "Wait a minute. I thought this was going to be like 500 bucks." So, have you ever met with a client and spent time agonizing over a proposal only to realize you're way off the client's price point? Yeah, me too. That's why you need a strategy for the first client meeting. You've got to take control of the meeting. You are spending your time with this client. You've got to make it count. Now, I've bolded that word spending because far too many of us don't realize that's exactly what we're doing. You are committing some time to this particular client who's made no reciprocal commitment back to you. You're choosing to spend time with this client. I don't know what your hourly rate is, but that's what you're investing my hourly rate for web work is $165 an hour. So if I'm going to spend time with this client and invest an hour in this initial client meeting, it is as though I'm spending $165 on that client. You're spending your time. You've got to make it count. And if you'll make that switch in your mind, this becomes incredibly important. Incredibly important. How much money, if you put a dollar per hour, how much money over the last year have you wasted on clients by spending too much time in the first meeting and getting no return on your investment? Far too much, probably, right? Okay, so let's talk about what is the purpose of the initial client consultation? Why are we there to begin with? Now, the first answer is we're trying to sell a website, right? For most of us, that's pretty, I mean, why else do you meet with a client? You're trying to figure out what they want and sell them something. And that's part of it, but it's not the whole thing. It's not just to sell a website. I would submit to you that the first meeting with a client is like a first date. Okay? You've got to be sure that this relationship is going to work. How many of you have worked with a bad client? Yes, okay, we all have. If you're, if you're working with clients, you've had a bad one. That's why I call them friendly monsters in this book. <laughs> you've worked with bad clients, okay? Now, how many of you realize at the very beginning from the first conversation this was a bad client? <laughs> you did it anyway? Yeah, so we've all done that too. But so here's the thing. You've got to position this first meeting like a first date. You are getting the best version of this client that you're ever going to get. It's like a first date. I mean, you go in, you know, it's been a long time since I was dating, like many years. My wife and I will celebrate 25 years this year. Woohoo, we made it. Uh, but, you know, so way back, you know. But when you're meeting with the first date, you think about it, you're on your best behavior. And the, the client consultation is that way. So you've got to figure out if this whole thing is going to work. Now, let me, let me talk about what the client consultation is not. Because a lot of times, it's easier to define what something is by figuring out what it's not first. It's not just to sell a website. That's part of it, but it's not the whole thing. First of all, it's to test the waters, test the relationship. Second of all, it's not to refine the client's business plan. How many of you have spent time with a client and you realize, I am offering business consulting to this person? Yeah, by the way, that's a separate service. And you should be charging for that. If you have the ability to do that kind of thing, the website may need to come later. We'll talk about that in just a minute. You are not there to refine the client's business plan. How much have they committed to pay you at this point? Zero dollars. Okay. That's a whole other talk. 
Also, it's not to answer how questions. This is an important distinction. How questions are intellectual property. I'll answer all the what questions all day long. What are we going to build? What does it need to be? What does it need to look like? Those are free. How questions cost money. How questions are intellectual property. So those are some of the things that client consultation is not. Now, if you're like me, you've wasted a lot of time with clients doing those three things and never gotten a dime back return on investment for the time that you've spent with the client. So, what do you do? What is the purpose of the client consultation? Now, I want to give you a very easy to remember acronym. It is simply SCOPE. There's five purposes of the client consultation, each of which is one of these letters. Now, we're going to do a deep dive into each of these in just a minute, but the first one is easy. The S in SCOPE, are you ready for this? Stands for SCOPE. You got it? Okay, this is the easy one, right? The S in SCOPE stands for SCOPE. The first thing you're going to do in the client consultation, you're trying to learn enough about the project to create a proposal for the client. Now, for most of us, that's what we're doing already. We're there talking to the client. We're trying to figure out what, what they want, what can we do, just to gather all the information so we can present an intelligent proposal back to the client for what they're asking for, right? Sound familiar? This is what we do. But for too many of us, it stops there. And I'd like to suggest there are at least four other purposes. The C in scope stands for chemistry. You've got to figure out if this is a person you can work with. And you better do that in that first meeting. If you're in that first meeting and things are not going well, it's time to gracefully exit and maybe suggest another web developer that could make them successful. The O in scope stands for ongoing, ongoing services. Explain the importance of the ongoing services you offer. And by the way, you do offer ongoing services, right? Every single person who builds WordPress sites for clients needs to be offering WordPress management services. If you're not doing that, I promise you, you will not be successful in the long term. It is virtually impossible to succeed working with clients unless you have some sort of recurring revenue, starting with WordPress management uh, contracts, coming into your business. That's a talk on its own. And that conversation, by the way, has to start at the first meeting. That's got to be positioned as part of the price that you're offering. The P in scope stands for your process. Set expectations early by walking through the process you use to create websites. And you do have a process, right? If you don't have a process that you use for every client, every project, every time, you need to work on that. That's one of the most important things you can do, especially if you're just starting out. You need to codify a process that you use every time. And don't get caught in the lie that, oh, I build custom websites. Me too, but I do it the same way for every client every time. There's a process. And by the way, that process has as much value as your end product to the client. And you have to explain that. Okay? The E in scope stands for estimate. And this is really the secret sauce in this strategy. Estimate, providing a ballpark estimate and getting client buy-in. We'll talk about that again in just a minute. Now, using this method, last year I closed over 90% of the proposals that I wrote. Now, I always struggle. Matter of fact, I sat right back in the back corner debating on whether I was going to take this slide out. And I literally, I gave this talk about eight times last year at different word camps. And every time before I speak, I, I struggle over this slide because what I don't want to come across as is some, you know, slick, weird marketing. That, that's not me, okay? And those of you that know me, you know that's not me. But I just want you to know this works, okay? Now, why MMV? Your mileage may vary. But this works. If you'll do this sort of process, tweak it for yourself, but use this sort of process, this will increase your conversion rate on proposals. Okay, let's take a deep dive. You ready? The S in scope stands for scope. We're going to learn enough about the project in order to create a proposal. Now, again, this is where most of us spend the entire time, and that's good. We're going to spend most of the time. If you allocate an hour, probably 45 minutes of it is going to be on this step working through what the client actually needs. Now, you may have a way to do this. Um, and if you don't, you, you need to have a consistent checklist of questions that you ask for every client, every project, every time to make sure you don't forget something. If you don't have a checklist, you're going to forget something. And Murphy's Law says the thing you forget is going to be the most important thing that you should have asked. Or you'll be sitting like me in my car thinking, ah, I forgot to talk about this. Right? So make a checklist, use it every time. And I would suggest 
doing it this way. Now, do what you want. This is what I do. I break the conversation up into five main buckets of questions. And I like this approach because we can modify this depending on the client we're talking to. In other words, you know, we can start with various buckets depending on what is most important to them. There's a business bucket. We need to find out about them. There's a, the purpose of the website. There's the website itself. There's a launch questions and there's budget questions. Now, depending on the client, we can rearrange that. Uh, just for example, I was meeting with a client who is a, a local entity of a national nonprofit organization. I do a lot of work with nonprofits by choice. Now, if you know anything about local entities of national organizations, their budget is zero dollars, especially for marketing. And so guess where I started the conversation? Bing, right there, budget. Because we're not going to go any further if there's no conversation. You, know, you can modify this based on the client. Now, I'm going to put a bunch of questions up on the screen here, okay? It's all in that one-page download, or feel free to snap or whatever. But here's some questions you ought to ask in these five main buckets. And again, turn this into a checklist. Uh, I have a template in Evernote that I just duplicate for every client meeting. Check, check, check. Make notes. Check, check. Do something like that so you make sure you don't forget anything. So here's the business bucket. These are the sorts of questions you ought to be asking to every client about their business. What's your elevator pitch? What's your coffee shop answer? When somebody asks you who you are and what do you do, what's your answer to that question? If they can't clearly articulate what they do in two or three sentences, you may have a marketing problem. This person may not be able to articulate it. And if they can't articulate their business, how in the world do they expect you as a web developer to do it? Right? What do you do? What do you make? Who's your competition? Who's your ideal customer? Why do they choose you instead of your competition? What's your price point? How do you find your customers now? Do you have any existing brand identity? These are questions you need to figure out the answer to. The goal of this bucket is to understand how much they understand their business. I am constantly amazed at the number of small business owners and even professionals who don't know who they're serving. They don't know why, they don't get their market at all. And they're hoping that, well, they say I have to have a website, and that's going to solve all their problems. But wait a minute. If they can't articulate the message of their business, how can you, a third party who build websites, do that for them? Now, you may be able to. You may have the marketing chops to help them create that. But guess what? That's different than the website. That's work that has to happen first. That's marketing consulting. And you may or may not be able to do that. If you can, awesome. That's the first thing you pitch to them. Then we create a website. Otherwise, you're no different than somebody that's building, you know, do-it-yourself stuff on Squarespace. If you can't help them articulate their message to reach their market, the website is not going to be effective. Okay, those are the sorts of questions. Now, and again, by the way, the client may not be ready for a website, and marketing consulting may be the first step. How many of you get stalled on content? The client takes forever to give you content for the website. I, you know, I've been stalled for almost two years with a client on content, years ago. This is why content takes forever. Because if you're doing your job and you're asking the right questions about what it is the website is supposed to say, the business owner freezes up because, oh my gosh, I don't know how to articulate my message. And so they sit there with the blank screen and they don't, they don't know where to start. So marketing consulting may be something they need at the beginning. The second bucket of questions is the purpose, the purpose bucket. How does the web fit into your marketing strategy? It's remarkable how many times I get a deer in the headlight look from that question when I ask it to a small business owner. Marketing strategy? Don't I just need a website? If we build it, they will come. You know that whole approach? Why should your ideal customer even come to your website? What are you offering them? What are your goals for the website? That last one is the most important thing to figure out because uh, we said earlier, you know, uh, the conversation about, uh, you know, we're not building the website for the client. We're building the website for who? The client's clients, the client's customers. And so if at the beginning you get written down a great purpose statement for what is, how do we know the website is going to be successful? Then the questions of 
is that shade of blue right? Which, Lord, how many of you have had that conversation? Those questions don't matter if they don't get you to the goal. At that point, we get into personal preference. And quite frankly, frequently, I'll have a conversation with the client that goes something like this. We're not building this website to reach you. You're already reached. I hope. I mean, I hope you're already a fan of your own business. We're trying to reach your constituency or your potential market. So the shade of blue, just trust me, it, the, the call to action button doesn't need to be blue. It needs to be bright orange because that's what people are going to click or whatever it needs to be. Bringing conversation back to the goal. That's all in the purpose. So get all that down at the beginning. Again, by the way, the client may not be ready for a website. If they can't answer these questions, your step needs to be, we need to step back and do a discovery phase. Well, we're going to figure out all the answers to these questions that you don't know the answers to. And a discovery phase sounds really fancy. It's simply a list of all the questions we're going to answer and a price to find those answers. It's a scope and a price just like a project. And at the end, they get a nice report, and that's what they pay for. And from that, we can now build the website and be successful. Does that make sense? Scope and deliverables for a price. All right, so we've talked about the business. We've talked about the purpose. Now we get into the website bucket. Now, for most freelancers, this is all they ever ask about. They don't get into any of the other buckets. And if that's what you're doing, you need to expand the questions you're asking. But these are important, right? Do you have a domain name? Who's our point of contact at your company? That's, there's a loaded question here. But you want to know that. Am I working with an 18 committee or am I working with you, the business owner? Because that's important. If there's a layer between me and you, we're not going to be successful probably. Who's our point of contact? Where will the content for the site come from? There's a huge assumption that's made by most clients that you're not only going to build the tech behind the website, you're going to create the content as well. And maybe you can do that. But if you do it, your price needs to go up or you need to bring in a copywriter and charge accordingly. Most clients aren't qualified to write the content for their site in a way that is digestible by their target market. Roughly how many pages will the site include? Now that's a soft question because you and I both know that in WordPress it's copy, paste, boom, publish, page, done. And so back in the day when we were doing everything by, with HTML, the number of pages was important. Today, not as big of a deal unless you're using a page builder and you're handcrafting pages. So I will frequently in a proposal, you know, talk about we're going to create custom crafted pages for these sections. And like there's five of them and that's going to affect the price point because those take a lot more time than just copy, paste, publish, right? All right. Uh, are you going to be blogging or sharing news items? Are you selling things online? There's another subsection of questions that come if it's going to be an e-commerce site. Do you need an event calendar? Do your clients need to log in for any reason? That's a big question to ask. I've gotten to the end of the project and they go, where do my clients log in to get their bills online? Uh, what? We didn't even talk about that. Massive assumption. You've got to ask all these questions at the beginning. Do you use social media? Which networks? Do you have video you want to use? Testimonials? Do you have them already? Or are we going to be waiting six months for you to get around to asking your customers for testimonials? Are there any third-party integrations needed? Because if so, then we've just added a zero probably at the end of your project, depending on what it is. Should the website simply be a credibility piece, or do you want to generate leads from search results? That's such an important question to ask if you're not doing it now. With a lot of clients don't need to pay for SEO. If you build the website with good, solid, be best practices for technical SEO on page and it's <coughs> done well, they may not need advanced SEO. A lot of small businesses especially, they don't have the manpower to deal with 20 leads a week off the web. They want one. Some clients would be happy if they had three solid leads a month off their website. You know, if, if, if people search my business name, are they going to find me? Yes, if you build the site right. Virtually always, just a WordPress out of the box, as long as you're not intentionally screwing something up, you're going to have pretty good technical SEO right off the bat, just with the way WordPress feeds the information to the search engines. Do they need to pay for more? I don't know, but that's a question to ask. Last of all, this is the catch-all question. This always ends this bucket of questions for me. Aside from communicating information and other things we've talked about, is there anything else the website needs to do? because we need to know that. Is there anything else at all? And sometimes later on the client may come back and say, well, I thought it was going to do this. Well, remember I asked you, 
is there anything else the website needs to do? And you said, no. I'm happy to do that, but it's going to cost me. Right? Okay, the launch. Getting to the fun part. Uh, there's some questions you need to ask about the launch of the website. Do you have a deadline? And is it tomorrow? Right? How do you handle email? How many of you have stepped into the black hole of hell that is client email? Oh my gosh. We stopped providing email services years ago um, for that very reason. That's a, that's a long conversation. Last of all, who will be responsible for maintaining the site after it's been launched? Because that's important. Okay, the goal here is determining the time frame and starting the discussion about those ongoing services. Last of all, the budget bucket. The budget bucket is, hey, do you have a ballpark budget for this? What are we talking about here? Do you have $500 or 5000 or 15000 or twenty? You know, What is it? Uh, some clients don't want to answer that question, but I simply tell them, look, I need to understand what we're talking about here because maybe we can simplify or do things in phases. If you have a small budget, we can work with that. We can build you something good and solid, fit it in your price range, and later we can expand to add these other nice things that you'd like to have. Uh, what is, by the way, the decision-making process for selecting your web developer for this project? How, you know, is, are you, have, do you have to get three bids? Is it whoever you personally like? Are you just having to get a number of bids so you can really select your next door neighbor who you want to do the website to begin with? I mean, what's the decision making process? Is it you that's making the decision or is it your boss or some committee? What is that process like? And when do you expect to make that final decision? The goal here is to make sure you're not wasting time. Uh, I don't respond to RFPs simply because they take too long. That's not my market. You know, if you're interviewing 10 other web developers, probably not my client. You know, it's not that I couldn't compete in that world, but I just don't want to deal with the hassle and the length of time. If you want to hire me, hire me and let's go. Let's, let's do the work. Okay, so those are the five buckets of questions. Does that make sense? Any questions on this stuff that we've talked about so far before we go into chemistry? Yes. Okay. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Yep. We'll get to that. That's in the, the E of scope, the estimate. Such as? Mm, okay, yeah. So what do you do if the client, for the recording, what do you do if the client is wanting something that's just not the best idea? That's a, so in the first meeting, you don't want to spend a lot of time there, but it's a great test of the water for you to push back and go, you know, for what you're describing, that doesn't sound like the best idea. What if we did this? And their response, that, that, uh, their, that, their response to what you tell them in that scenario is going to tell you a lot about whether that's a person you want to work with or not. Are they going to insist on having their own way, or are they going to listen to the professional? Because if they push back, no, I want to... I'm probably going to start landing the plane and ending the meeting because they're not going to take them. This is the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> At what point do you... Yes. you guys get that? You see how important that question is? Okay. The answer to that question is the answer to this, is the same answer to this question, which is how can you compete designing custom website sites when there's free options like Wix and Weebly and Squarespace? The answer is we're always a consultant. 
The reason they hire us is not because we can put a site together in WordPress. It's that we can solve their problem. They may not be able to fully articulate their problem, but we may be able to help them understand it and then bring a solution that solves the problem to reach more customers, to get more leads, or whatever it is. That's the value you bring. It's the reason why I'm hiring a tile person to come in and tile my bathroom instead of going to Home Depot and buying a bunch of tile. It's the same issue. Uh, and I don't know if I'm answering your question or not, but you're always a consultant. That's the value you bring. That's why you can charge the money that you're asking. Otherwise, send them to Squarespace and let them figure it out. You know, those websites look beautiful on TV, but if, TV, but if you ever seen one in person, wow. It's like me trying to do tile in my bathroom. One's going to be like, eh. My wife's going to go, this is not going to do. Uh, yes. I'm going to answer that in just a minute. Yeah, we'll get to that at the end. It, it, that's the E part. Yeah, okay. So let's press forward here because I'm running short on time, actually. I didn't realize where we're at. So let's talk about chemistry. You've got to decide, is this a client you can work with? Okay? Huge, hugely important. Listen. When you're at, you probably spent 45 minutes or so with a client at this point, roughly. During that time, listen just listen to what they say, and most importantly, how they say it. When you push back on things, how are they, you know, are they, are, do they respect you as a professional? Do they respect your opinion? Watch for those red flags, because at the end of this point, when you've reached the scope, end of the scope questions, you ought to have a good feeling of whether this is a person you can work with or not. Are you going to be able to do something good, good work for this particular client? And for everybody, the answer is not always the same. You know, this may not be a client I can work with, and that's okay. You gotta, it's, it's like dating. You've got to see if there's chemistry there. Can I actually work with this person? Now, there's a few red flags that I see a lot of times from my own experience and in coaching. You know, I've had hundreds of coaching conversations with freelance web developers over the last several years. And the first is unanswered questions. If the client doesn't know what they need, obviously a discovery phase can be helpful. So watch for those unanswered questions. If they can't answer it, then you're going to have to add more time in for that. Another red flag is being disrespectful. If the client doesn't listen to you, if they're not taking your advice, if they interrupt you, if they're already nickel and diming you out of the gate, oh, I can get hosting for $5 a month over at blah, blah, blah dot com, run, okay? If the client is a jerk, this is not a person you want to work with, and you don't have to work with everybody. If there's scheduling problems, if the person you're trying to meet with is hard to reach, or if they reschedule, or if they're late. This, again, it's not necessarily a deal breaker, but it's a red flag that you better pay attention to. Because if the client is hard to reach now, that's probably not going to change when you're working with them on building the website. It's probably not going to change. If the client complains about a web developer who did everything wrong, that's a full stop. We're going to dig into that. Okay. Now, let me say this. I've been in the web space a long time, and I know that there are a bunch of knuckle-headed web developers out there, okay? How many of you have done rescue work? This is the kind where somebody built the website, and God, they made some stupid decisions when they built that thing. I don't know. I inherited a website one time that had 33 different custom image sizes defined. Who does that? <laughs> Who does that? I mean, really, it was stupid. And then the web developer, poof, they're gone. They disappeared. The client's locked out of their website. They don't have their domain. They don't have anything, right? So, okay. There's a bunch of knuckle-headed web developers out there. That said, if a client complains about a previous web developer who did everything wrong, I'm going to stop and dig into that because it could be this is a client that cannot be pleased. And if I don't weed that out early, then six months from now, that guy's going to be sitting across the table from another web developer complaining about me. Right? Complaints, huge red flag. Emergencies. The client needs everything done immediately. Again, not a deal breaker, but you better figure out why. A couple of frequent mistakes I see folks make, and that's ignoring those red flags. <laughs> we want to work with somebody. We want to get paid for our work, so we'll ignore the red flags and take on a bad client. If you think a red flag is no big deal, you're making a mistake. Again, this is the first date. Red flags are the tip of the iceberg. There's a whole lot more underneath that you better figure out. Don't make excuses for the client in your own mind. 
I want to work with them, therefore I'll kind of ignore these things that I feel just not quite right. Trust your gut when it comes to working with clients. Another frequent mistake is the hero syndrome. The hero syndrome is the need to fix the client. The hero syndrome is going above and beyond, doing way more than you're paid for, to come in with your boots and cape and save the day. And that will destroy your business. As a reformed hero, I tell you this from personal experience. Uh, this is our talk on this, and I don't have time to get into it today. All right, so you with me? That's the scope. That's S. Uh, and chemistry. Now let's talk about the O, which is your ongoing services. Explain the need for your ongoing services. Now, uh, what I've learned over the years, I mentioned it earlier, is that when it comes to selling WordPress management s products, if you want to build recurring revenue by selling Word hosting and backups and security and WordPress updates and all those things, Education is the key, and it's got to start from the first conversation. Take it to the bank. If you try to add this on later, or it, it comes in as a gotcha, oh, when you're launching the site, oh, by the way, you need to pay me $50, $75, $100, $150 dollars a month to manage your website. The client is going to feel screwed. You can't, you got, that has to be talked about from the first conversation. So, and I just explained to them, look, this is, WordPress needs to be kept up to date. There are certain things that need to happen. And uh, I'm not, you know, they don't need to make a decision right now, but we'll teach you how to do it, or we provide a white glove service that does it for you. You just need to be aware that's part of the pricing here. The kind of client that I work with is relieved to know they'll have somebody in the web space they can trust to manage their website. I'll pay you $100 a month, $200. $300 a month, depending on what you're doing. I'll pay you for your work. I'm just, I'm glad to know that I have someone to call. I call it having one neck to strangle when it comes to everything about your website, right? I provide everything for them. Okay, education is the key. The P in scope stands for process. Set expectations early by walking through your process. And again, you do have a project, right, that you use for every client, every project, every time. If you don't have that, you need that. So you're working every project the same way. Talk it through with the client. Explain the steps that are involved. Explain the tools that are involved. And by tools, I mean the stuff they're going to interact with as a client. Explain the value that your process brings. We are not those kinds of web developers who are going to disappear on you halfway through the project. We have, this is the way we do every project. By explaining your process to the client, it builds up your credibility. Your process has as much value as the end product. And when you explain this to the client, you know, you're, you're not going to be left on your own. We're going to walk with, this is how we build websites. Set expectations for what that's going to look like. It doesn't have to take long, just explain it. Last of all, the estimate. Provide a ballpark estimate at the end of the conversation and get client buy-in. Now this is key. Because I have spent lots of time working on a proposal, far too much time, fiddling on the price, fiddling on the price, 3500 4000 3725 3775 until you find some number that resonates magically with you, and then you send it off to the client. It is much better to talk about price at the very beginning of your interaction with the client. We hate talking about price for the most part. Most of us are scared to death to talk about money with the client. But if you... It, it, your ability to talk about money with the client is one of the things that will make you successful in the web business. You've got to get your head around it. So what I do, you, by this point, you ought to know enough about the project to offer a ballpark, a ballpark price. I usually give a $1,000 range. You do what you want to do. This is what I do, okay? So I'll finish up this conversation. I'll say, Mr. Client, Mrs. Client, based on everything we've talked about today, what you're describing is a website that's probably going to be between five dollars and $6,000 to build. If I return to you tomorrow a proposal within that price range, are you ready to start? And if not, I'm going to figure out why not. Now, you go back, you build the proposal, and it comes in that price range, and they ought to be ready to start. If they're, if they're not good with that price range, why would I invest any more time in this client relationship than I already have? If they, you know, without them being committed to that price range, I'm not going to spend the hour that it's going to take to write that proposal or 30 minutes or two hours or however long it's going to take you. Why, why would you spend more time? I've wasted hours of my life doing that. 
Maybe you have too. So, you come back with a proposal that has no surprises. It contains the management fee every month. It contains the website within the price range that you quoted. No surprises. Let's do business together. Does that make sense? So that's the scope strategy. It starts with the scope of the project, chemistry with the client, your ongoing services, an overview of your process, and that estimate to get the client buy-in before you go any further. You do that. Last year, I closed 90% of the proposals that I wrote. It works. All right, let's take questions. Again, my name is Nathan Ingram. You can find me at nathaningram.com slash WCDayton for the slides and the one-page summary. Uh, also, training.ithemes.com is iThemes Training, where we do uh, WordPress training all year long, two or three live webinars a week. Virtually everything else is free. Everything we do there is free. And mywpbusiness.com for the podcast launching in a few weeks. Yes, sir. Well, <clears throat> I feel a trap. Great question. I'm actually building a service right now called Disaster Flow that's going to help freelancers answer those questions and have a backup plan. Okay, so how many of you have a backup plan if you got hit by a bus? You have a document somewhere that says, in case of my death, this is where all my passwords are. This is what my hosting is. This is my account. This is, if you hate your family, die without that document. <laughs> Look, listen, let me tell you why this is important. After WordCamp Atlanta, two years of 2015, WordCamp Atlanta, 2016, I was having a conversation with a guy in the hallway. He hired me as a coach the next week. We started working together. We had one call. This is a guy that was 32 years old, in great health, mountain biked all the time. He went in the mountains of North Georgia, got on his mountain bike, and dropped dead. Left a wife and two small kids. We don't know what tomorrow holds. So this is an important question to answer. If you don't have that, start putting something like that together. Okay, uh, what do you do? You develop a network of freelancers. You have some. For, for me personally, I have a support manager that handles all my client uh, support needs. She has the key to the kingdom for everything in my business, and my wife knows who she is. And if that happens, then we're covered. You know, I have a step-by-step -step document that guides through all that. We all need something like that. And it can be as simple as I have a friend that's a freelancer, and we do this for each other. We have our master LastPass password. We understand how our business, you know, whatever. But you need to have somebody like that in your life. Thanks for asking that question. Did I answer it or did I skip around too much? Thank you very much. Yes. Ah, how do you fire a client? Okay, that's a great question. Um, okay, so you, you know, it, I, I work these days exclusively by referral. I don't spend any money on advertising, never really have. And so... The answer to that question is, how do they find you? If they just found you off, you know, online, it may be a little simpler. If, if a client comes to me and I realize they're not a good fit, or you know, it, and it depends on where in the process of the project they are, um, the answer varies. It's a, you know, we can talk after, I'm happy. But like, if you're in this conversation, you realize this is not a client that you want to work with, but that client has been referred to you by one of your good clients, you want to make that referral look like gold. So you don't want to say, I can't work with you. You need to give them what's your next step. I don't think we're a good fit. Based on what you've described, I don't think I'm going to be able to help you. Let me offer you a few other recommendations. If the client's just a jerk, first of all, most of my clients are good people, and they're all good people, and they're not going to refer jerks. Good people like to refer good people to good people. That's why it's good to build your network. Um, but you know, if you're in the middle of a project, then you need to have a clear documented process of what happens if, you're, if you've been engaged by a client and that relationship needs to sever what happens next. That needs to be outlined in your contract. Uh, so that's a long answer. Uh, get a contract. Um, if you look at NathanIngram.com in the courses section, there's a process course of which this talk is a part and my whole contract that I use for clients is in that course. Yes? Uh, for in the content. How do you get the content from the client? 
a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> Doesn't work. Uh, okay, so it's hard, and the reason clients stall on content is they have trouble articulating what they do. It's hard. How many of you, by the way, have been sitting trying to redevelop your website for forever, and you're having trouble with your own content? Right? Okay, and we're supposed to be the professionals. So have some empathy on the client who has to do it for themselves, all right? So uh, there's a couple of things I do. If the client, first of all, I, every project starts with a content guide where it's just a big, long Word document that asks lots of questions to help them start thinking through. This is your about page. This is where you're going to talk about this and this. How do you describe this and you, how do you describe it? it? It's just full of leading questions, and they start typing. Okay? If they have trouble with that, there's two options. We can hire a copywriter to come in and basically walk through that whole content guide interview style. Or, you know, I do a lot of writing myself, and some, depending on the client, I'll schedule a half a day or a day to sit down with them and help them process that information. But it starts with, you know, all, every project we do has a content guide. And that, will, that does a, goes a long way. Now, there is something that's very important. Uh, it's a phrase that a friend of mine uh, named Adam Walker from Atlanta used years ago, and it's totally changed my business. Okay, you ready for this? No code before content. No code before content. These days I call it content first, which means we don't move an inch on your project until we have 100% of your content in-house ready to go. Because otherwise what happens is you get one day the about page, and, and then you're, the website's asleep for a week. And the next day you get a, the next day of the bio. And six months from now we're still waiting on the CEO to get his friggin' picture taken, right? We give him the content guide, and we don't move an inch until we get it back and all the assets for the website, every picture, every video, every everything, then we build the website. How quickly could you build the website if you had 100% of the assets at the beginning? A few days? Then why not do that? It's your process. That's what your, that's what your process needs to be, right? It's, it's so simple, but I've wasted months of my life not doing it that way. It's coming. I don't have it out yet. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, sorry. Sure. Yes. Okay, so here's the thing. Uh, <laughs> something in the way that you said that makes me think, I don't know if she thinks that's a great idea or not. But So here's the thing. I've tried everything. There are lots of services out there. You know, and some clients are intimidated by, a, you know, a service like Content Snare, which is a great solution. I know the guy that built it. You know, it's a, it's a good solution. Some clients are intimidated about sitting in front of a website and typing in their stuff. Everybody can open a word processing document and type. So it's a Word doc or Google doc, whatever you want to use. But the, the point is, you want to ask a bunch of questions, leading questions. And the content guide is probably 80% the same for most sites that I do. Probably 80% the same, but you know, other parts. And by the way, in that content guide, it's not just the content for the website. It asks questions about their domain name and the registration and different things. So when we get that guide, every single thing we need to build that website is in it. And you know, I'm 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 one for simple solutions, and I just can't get away from the word doc. Yes. Yes, and so in particular, and I'm, I'm working on a content piece for, piece for that issue right now, uh, learning at the very beginning, is the client I'm talking to a people person or are they a task person? Most people are one or the other, right? That's just brain wiring. If it's a people person, it might behoove me to, as part of the scope of work, schedule in a half a day to sit with them in there, because a people person is going to struggle sitting in front of a blank, you know, and typing away. It's just schedule time for them just and just ask them those questions directly. And the price goes up on the website to accommodate for that time, but I'll sit in front of them with Evernote and record the conversation and take notes and, you know, write in the time. Oh, they said, that, you know, 50 minutes and 32 seconds. They explained it this way and it was great. And I'll go back and, you know, 
as we're putting all the content together, that's what the content comes from. If they're a task-oriented person, that process will scare them to death because they want to think about it. And, you know, they're the person that's going to do better with a document on the screen. So you know, just know who you're dealing with. Okay, here's the question. Are, the, are they selling, are they, here, the question is, are they selling bug zappers? Then the bad idea. Because if they're selling bug zappers, that's genius. Yeah. And, and that's where I, I love I love it when the client has bad ideas during this first con this con because what that can do is short circuit a bad client relationship before it starts. No pun intended with the bug zapper. But so here's the thing: uh, it's like the question we had a minute ago. When you push back on a client and say that's a bad idea, their next response to you is going to tell them if you can work with them or not. And so I, I look for those sorts of things in those conversations. It's a test of the water. It's a, it's a chemistry test. Yeah. On the fly? Ah, I got it. Let's see what you did. All right. So if, if let's just say in the scenario that this came up, three, you know, we're in the project. Oh, hey, look at this nice shiny thing, literally, that I want to do. Uh, we're going to end the puns about birds, uh, bugs after now. So here's what you say. You know, if we did that, it's going to cost you about $1,000 to do it. Is it, is it that important? And we do, and I, professionally, I don't think that's going to get us to the goal, the goal that we agree that this website is supposed to accomplish. Right? Yes. Yes. Have, and that, there's so much wisdom in what Topher just said. They're hi well, they, they've hired you because you know more than they do. So don't be afraid of that. All right, any other questions? We need to wrap up. Yes. Yes. Oh, great question. Great question. So in my, in my process, a, a good process and a good contract is a, uh, is a balance of expectations and consequences, right? And we're very clear. Uh, 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 any relationship is based on commitments. And we're going we're gonna to commit back and forth to each other, okay? I've just committed to you some time. I'm not going to commit back to you more time to write a proposal until you commit to me that this price range is good. I'm going to give you this proposal. The very next thing that needs to happen is another commitment back to me of a check. Okay? So they're going to pay half up front, typically, in my process. It's always half up front. Now, what, depending on the length of the project, they may pay 25-25 or a, a half, you know, the last half upon launch if it's a small project. So, you know, we'll start the work not until we get the deposit and we don't launch until the project in full is paid for. And I don't have collections problems at all. Sure. Yeah. 
actually, I actually have in my contract that the, the deposit is non-refundable for any reason, and I, I, I stand on that uh, because I put a, you know, by the time we get to the, even the point of the proposal, I've got several hours into the project dealing with them, and don't think that all the, the nurturing that got you to the point of the signing of the contract, that has value. It's just as valuable as what comes after. So, you know, that, for me, I don't do any refunds at all. Um, you know, I, I can't think of a thing. Even, even when there's a bad situation, I've never refunded. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. It depends. If that's a particular concern to the client, yes. If it's most clients don't ask about that. It's very plainly worded in the contract. So, yeah, it depends on the client. Any other questions? Yes, sir. There's no such thing. Yeah, there, there's no such thing. You know, you need to, you, you need to, you, you have to figure out enough about the project in order to make a scope of work that has a price. If you don't know enough about the project, then you step back and do a discovery phase, which has a scope of these questions we're going to get answered. And from those answers, now we can build another proposal for the next part. Yeah, we're way over. Yeah, I'll be here. If you guys have questions, want to come up?